verse number 35, the Bible says, For whosoever findeth me findeth life, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. But he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul, and they that hate me love death. So here we see a contrast. So again, the book of Proverbs many times is contrasting um, two things. You see one side of the coin and then either on the, the second part of that verse or the next verse over, you'll see the other um, half of that where the Bible says, you know, here it's saying to love the Lord is to love life or to find um, life. Who findeth me findeth life and shall obtain favor of the Lord. So it's equating life with um, favorable, um, being f favor of the Lord. And then in verse number 36, it's on the flip side of that, it's comparing death to those that, it's basically equating hating the Lord with those that love death. All right, so what are we talking about this morning? So coming up tomorrow um, and the day after tomorrow is this thing called Halloween. Um, I don't even want to call it a, a holiday. You know, a lot of people will say it's a holiday. I just want to say, um, in the United States, Halloween is celebrated tomorrow, and then the next day, um, celebrated especially um, in California, especially in Fresno, is this thing called the Day of the Dead. All right, is celebrated on the first of November. Now, these things in the United States, if you've noticed over the years, they're getting more and more what I would call actually out of control. Um, you know, Halloween. Um, you know, it seems like, you know, we go out soul winning. I've said this before, but the soul winner will have their, their, their finger on the pulse of the community um, closer than anyone. You'll be able to see what's going on. You'll be able to see um, how people's beliefs change, what people are into, what they're not into. Um, Halloween is getting completely out of control um, in this country. I mean, it seems like, you know, the trend seems like the less expensive the neighborhood, the more people spend on, uh, you know, Halloween things and all these decorations. Um, the latest thing that I've been seeing that was new to me this year is people, I've seen it twice now, people literally digging up their front yard. People have dug up their front yard to make, you know, graves and, and gravestones and skeletons laying in the graves and things like this, literally destroying their, their property to just, you know, decorate for, you know, this idea of Halloween. So the point is that it's just getting more and more extreme. It's very easy for most people, not just soul winners, to see this. Um, but we're going to look this morning at why that is happening. We're going to look at why it's happening. You know, there must be an agenda here. There must be an agenda. So let's do a quick Bible study this morning and kind of look at if we can see, you know, what the Bible says about some of these things. Um, we'll learn a lot of things this morning, more just, not just about Halloween and the Day of the Dead, but you'll, you'll see this morning how Satan works in society. Um, the first thing that Satan wants to do with serious things in society, you'll see with Halloween and the Day of the Dead, is just make light of these things. Make them seem like they're not that bad. All right. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Let's do a quick, let's take the plane off this morning and we'll do a quick Bible study and then we'll kind of come back to this idea of, you know, how God wants us to view sin and how Satan wants us to view sin. You'll see that there's two very different philosophies um, when it comes to um, the devil's agenda and God's agenda. Of course, we can expect that, right? But look at Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5 and look at verse number 7. So in Ephesians chapter 5, um, the context here is that Paul is writing um, to the church at Ephesus. He's writing um, to these Gentiles, to these new believers. You know, this obviously applies um, to us, but he's, he's kind of telling them, like, hey, you need to get out of these things. And we're learning the same thing um, in the book of Acts. There's these cultural divides. Everyone's getting saved. Um, some of the Jews got saved. The Gentiles are getting saved. Um, the Jews were kind of, you know, taken aback by the fact that, you know, Gentiles are also, you know, getting saved. Now you have a church of these people. So, you know, they're try kind of trying to get everybody into church and growing as new believers. Look at verse number 7, where Paul says, Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Now notice verse number 8 here. He's, so he's saying, you know, you've got to be separate now. You've got to be different from these people outside now that you've accept, you know, you've become believers and you're saved. Now, but look at verse number eight, he says, for ye were sometimes, he says, ye were sometimes darkness. 
Now, notice he doesn't say you were in darkness. He says you were literally, you were darkness. You know, he kind of equates, you know, this group of people that were unsaved and are now saved. He says you were darkness, but now you're what? It says you were darkness, but now, ye, now are ye light in the world. So he says you have literally become, you were darkness, and now you have become light. He's equating unbelief with darkness and belief with light, all right? He, then look what he says. He says, walk as children of light. Now, he, that's, he's saying, do what, what people that are supposed to be in the light or supposed to be light do. For the fruit of the Spirit, capital S, now these people have the Spirit in them. They're saved. They're indwelled by the Holy Spirit. You know, they're sealed by the Holy Spirit. They have the down payment that God gave them of being the temple of the Holy Spirit. They have the Holy Spirit in them. So do you, all of you this morning. For the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, pro proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. And then again, look what he says in verse number 11. He says, and have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, rather reprove them. So there's two things that he says in verse number 11. He says, okay, he's like, you were darkness. He's like, you were literal darkness now you are light. He's like, you should do things that prove the fruits of the Spirit, that prove that you have the Holy Spirit in you. You should walk, meaning you should do these things. You should live a life that shows that you have the Holy Spirit in you. That's all, that's all of us. We all have the Holy Spirit in us. We should not grieve that Holy Spirit. We should live a life. We should walk a life that shows that light to the darkness, and then for those people that are still darkness, he says, he says two things. He says, number one, have no fellowship with them. Don't be doing the things that they're doing. Don't be going to those parties. Don't be doing those works of darkness. But instead, look what he says. He says, but rather reprove them. So he says, don't be, don't be fellowshipping with the darkness, but you should be speaking against the darkness. It's like you should actually be reproving the darkness. That means correcting the darkness. That means when, you know, there's darkness, there's people still doing these things. Those people, those people need to be corrected. So the light should shine on that and correct it. Verse number 12. For it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. But all things, again, that are reproved. So he's like, you should reprove them. Why reprove them? He says, all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whosoever doth make manifest is light. So it's saying the light should reprove the darkness. It's like shining a flashlight. Make manifest means made known. So what the Bible here is saying is it's kind of like giving some hope to the people that are in the darkness. The Bible is saying that the light should make known the darkness Make the truth known to the darkness. So, look, there, I mean, isn't that true? Isn't there a lot of people that are in darkness today that don't even know that these things are wrong? These things that we'll talk about this morning, there's a lot of people that are just doing them because that's what people do. There's a lot of people out there just going along with society because that's what people do. They don't even know that it's wrong. But when the light shines on it, it will be known that it's wrong. Right? Imagine, there's people that are celebrating Halloween and Day of the Dead that would tell you they believe the Bible. They're not saved. They would tell you they believe the Bible. And then when you went up and you showed them the Bible, that's reproving those works. And they would be like, oh man, I didn't even know that. There's a lot of people like that. There's a lot of people there. They're not evil people. We'll talk about those as well. They don't love, you know, death and love these things, but they just don't have any idea because it's not known to them, which is why God says that, you know, the light shouldn't just be silent. The light shouldn't just, hey, you shouldn't just walk your own way and walk right. You should also reprove because there's still people over there that are darkness that they just don't know. It's not manifest to them. It's not known that it's wrong to them. All right. Nobody's telling them the Bible. We were just talking yesterday. My wife and I were just talking yesterday just about how many churches there are. There's churches everywhere everywhere. There's new churches popping up all over the place all the time. But none of these churches are teaching the Bible. None of these people, none of these churches are, that are popping up everywhere are, are showing people what the Bible says. 
That's the problem. So it's not going to be made manifest there. The darkness is not going to be made manifest by the light because the light is the Bible. The light is, is God's word. All right. Look at verse 14. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. So we can wake people up that are still in the darkness, the Bible is saying here. Turn to Proverbs chapter 14. This is why people think you know, this is why people will think, so the Bible here is saying that you shouldn't be part of any of that darkness, but you should rather reprove it, all right? But this is why people will think the Bible-believing Christian, you know, is, is extreme today. You know, when they go out and they celebrate things like Halloween, they celebrate things like the Day of the Dead, when these things become normal in society, people will look at the Bible-believing Christian that doesn't want to have anything to do with that, and they'll say, that seems extreme, that you don't even want to do that. Because what are they doing? They're making light of sin. Because it's been, it's been made light, it's been made nothing to them. They haven't had that light shined on the darkness for them. Look at Proverbs chapter 14 and verse number 9. I mean, the Bible says in Romans 7, 13, it says, you know, the, the law is used to make sin that it might appear sin. You know, that sin, you know, that sin by the commandment, might be made exceedingly sinful, the Bible says. That's what the law will do. That's how it will make these things manifest. But unlike that, the devil's philosophy, while God's word will make sin seem exceedingly sinful, the devil wants to make light of sin. And God is saying, don't have any part of it. Instead, reprove it and make it known so people in the darkness can come out of that. Proverbs 14, 9 says, fools. Make a mock at sin. This is what the devil starts out doing with everything. He makes it seem like a joke. He makes it seem like it's fun. But among the righteous, there is favor, the Bible says. So look, sin always starts as a light thing. Sin always starts as a joke. Sin always starts as something that's portrayed as just fun. It's just a way for kids to get candy. I mean, it started out, I remember Halloween decorations when I was a kid with somebody putting, like, I mean, you all remember this. If, somebody putting, like a, like, a cardboard pumpkin in their window. Like these little cheap little cardboard pumpkins. Or a little, a little cartoon, a little cartoon witch in a window or something like that. Something that didn't look scary, it didn't look bad. I mean, we walked by one house the other day. Like, there was like a full-on metal cage hanging from the basketball hoop in the driveway. The cage was like four feet tall up in the air and like a rotting corpse inside the thing. I'm just like, hopefully that's not real. But, I mean, where, I mean, where do you even buy it? I mean, is that on Amazon or something? But, I mean, this stuff is like, can you imagine the money spent on this? Can you imagine, but like just going over the top to just celebrate death like this. But it started out, it started out as a joke. It started out as something fun, something light, and people still do that today. They make light of it. And it went to just celebrating death and just celebrating like Satan worship and all these terrible things. But ultimately, it's just like a celebration, like day of the day. It's a celebration of death. Halloween, I mean, should death be celebrated? That's the question today. That's, that's the question today. Should death be celebrated? Should a Christian, a Bible-believing Christian, should we celebrate death? Halloween, here's the origins of Halloween. This day marked the end of summer and the harvest and the beginning of the dark, cold winter at a time of the year that was often associated with human death. Pagans, the Celts mainly, believed that one night before the new year, the boundary between the worlds of the living and the dead became blurred. And the dead could come back. And on the night of October 31st is when they celebrated um, this day when the ghosts of the dead returned to earth. This is the origin of Halloween. That's supposed to be fun for kids. All right. The day of the dead is basically, I mean, the best way I can explain this without getting into great detail, it's like a family reunion for the dead. It's like a family reunion for dead people that you've known that died. All right. But here's the thing, they're both pagan practices, and here's what's super interesting, they're both pagan ceremonies or celebrations, 
and they were hugely adopted by the Catholic Church. Are you seeing a pattern with the Catholic Church, by the way? The Catholic Church has been adopting pagan practices and pagan beliefs since the beginning of its inception. The, pagan, the Catholic Church is literally, the Roman Catholic Church is literally a combination of pagan beliefs and Christianity. It's like pagan worship of idols and worship of gods. They, they mixed that into a blender with Christianity. Now we get worship of saints. We still kept the idols. We'll keep the idols. There's still idol worship. It's, it's just... The, the Catholic Church just adopts pagan culture everywhere it goes. But the point is, is the Day of the Dead and Halloween, kind of, they both made fun and made a celebration out of death. I mean, if you look at, you know, go around, a, uh, we actually, my wife and I actually went to a Mexican grocery store the other day to get some, uh, to get some presents to bring up to, um, to Canada, and there's just like all these decorated skulls and all this fun decorations of, of just celebrations of death all over the place for this day of the dead. You know, they, they leave food out for de the dead people, you know, and they're, it's just, they're, they're making light of it. What it is, it's making death seem tolerable. It's making death seem not that bad. You know, it's not just some you know, rotted skull. It's like this beautifully porcelain, painted up, artistic skull. It's basically making light of death. Turn to Romans chapter 6, verse number 23. If you're a soul winner, this one you have memorized for sure. But look, how should the unsaved world, how should the unsaved world, let's look at the unsaved world first. How should the unsaved world feel about death? How should they feel? The Bible tells us in Romans 6, 23, it says, the wages of sin is death. So the Bible here is saying that it, it does bring up death, and we bring this up all, it, it, whenever we preach the gospel to somebody, we will go to this verse as one of the first verses that we go to. The Bible says that, yes, death is something that's real. Death is something that's real, but it's actually what you deserve for your sin. So death is the punishment for your sin. The Bible is not talking about just physical death. In Romans chapter 6, in verse number 23. In Romans 20, 14, another verse that we always will go to when we're soul winning, it says, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. So there's two deaths. There's your physical death and then your spiritual death when you are cast into the lake of fire. When someone dies and they go to hell, and hell will eventually end up in the lake of fire, they end up spiritually dead in hell the Bible teaches. So immediately when somebody dies that is not saved, they will end up, their soul will end up in hell. And that is the second death. Look, death, and that death, the Bible says, is the penalty for sin, which everyone has. So does this sound like good news? Does this sound like, let's have a party? This is a very serious Thing. And this is why we, this is the first thing that we talk to with people when we're out preaching the gospel. We're, tell, we're telling them the, this very serious condition that they are currently in. So every unsaved person, every person that has not believed and trusted on the Lord Jesus Christ is currently in that position where they deserve that death, that spiritual death. I mean, darkness. Just think of the darkness of Halloween and the Day of the Dead. Halloween is celebrated in the dark. Halloween is complete. I mean, we just talked about darkness, but every activity, even the kids, I mean, people are sending their kids out into darkness And Halloween. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 13. Jeremiah chapter 13. I mean, I mean there's tons of crime, by the way, that happens on Halloween in the dark. All right, so darkness is just part of this celebration of death. Look at Jeremiah 13, 16. Look what God says. He says, give glory to the, to the Lord your God before he caused darkness and before your feet stumble upon the dark mountains. And while you look for light, he turn it into the shadow of death. Notice how he, he kind of compares, you know, he kind of equates darkness with death. And then he says, and make it gross darkness. Just associating darkness with death. 
Bad things always happen in the dark. My dad always told me this. He says, nothing good happens after nine. You know, when the kids would go out and he's like, nothing good ever happens. You think about all the things, the sin that happens in the dark. People that go to bars, they're in the dark. People that are in nightclubs, they're in the dark. There was a nightclub across from the old church downtown. And I'm sure I've never been inside that nightclub, but looking at the people that went in there, it was surely dark in there. I'm telling you, because if somebody would have went in there and flipped on the lights, everyone would have been like, it was definitely dark in that place. Why? Because darkness, it, it covers sin. Darkness, it just, it, what, what makes sin manifest? Light. And we are light. Turn to John chapter 3. Turn to John chapter 3. Jesus said this. When he was talking to Nicodemus, he, he said that this was a problem. Right? He said that this was a problem, Jesus comparing himself to the light. Look at John 3, verse 19. Jesus says, and this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world. But why didn't everyone just accept him? Why didn't everyone just accept Jesus when this light did come into the world? It says, and men love darkness rather than light. Why? Why do men love darkness? Because their deeds were evil. Dark things, sin, is it... it it grows, it, it flourishes in the dark, both spiritually and literally. This is why it's such a great um, analogy of this light and darkness, and God uses it all over the Bible. Look at verse 20. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. Again, you know, showing that just literal darkness, spiritual darkness, but he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made, again, manifest that they are wrought in God. So beware of things going on in the dark. Halloween is celebrated in the dark. Nothing good happens. In the, operate in the light. I preached a whole sermon on just darkness. So back to the question. Back to the question. Should we, so we see that unbelievers should not, there shouldn't be anything that they are excited about, about death. Unbelievers should be fearful of death. You know, they should be fearful, but what about us? Turn to Hebrews chapter 2. Turn to Hebrews chapter 2. And look at verse number 14. I was actually, I was telling my wife, I told my wife this after we landed, after the last plane, um, tr the last plane ride, and we landed, and we were walking into the Fresno airport um, yesterday afternoon. I told my wife, I said, you know, the funny thing about flying in a plane, the funny thing about flying in a plane Air traffic and flying in a, on a plane is much safer statistically than, than traveling in a car. Did you know that? It's like way safer. Just on the numbers of people that die flying in planes versus the numbers of people that die traveling in automobiles. But I told my wife, I said, the funny thing about, about flying in a plane, and I don't know, maybe I'm the only one that thinks this. My wife um, agreed with me. But she, th whenever you're going to take off in a plane, you always think about dying. I don't know why that is, but whenever you're getting ready to take off in an airplane, you always just think like, you know, when this huge airplane is like, you know, it's creaking and coming off the ground, you're like pretty much anything mechanically goes wrong right now and we're, you know, we're going to heaven, right? But I mean, you never think about that getting into a car, even though a plane is way safer and all that. So you think about dying, but how should the, how should the Christian feel about death? Look at Hebrews 2 and verse number 14. Hebrews 2, look at verse number 14. The Bible says, for, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Talking about Jesus here, that through his death he destroyed him that had the power of death. So Jesus destroyed him that had the power of death, He's like, who has the power of death? And then he explains, says, that is the devil. So the devil, the devil has power, the power of death over people that don't have Jesus, is what the Bible is saying here. But here's the thing. The devil doesn't have that power over me. If you're saved today, the devil doesn't have that power over you. The devil doesn't have that power of death over believers. Why? Because Jesus destroyed that. Jesus destroyed that. So, and then look at verse number 15. It says, and deliver them who through, and this is interesting right here, who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So before you were delivered, 
you should have had fear of death. You see what I'm saying? So I asked you the question, how should unsaved people feel about death? And the answer is, they should fear it. Because, and, and here's the thing, you, you won't even have to give this to somebody. The Bible is saying that the unsaved person will just, a, a normal unsaved person will just have a natural fear of death. It comes along with that conscience package from Romans 2.15. And look, you know this is true if you're a soul winner. You know this is true if you go out soul winning. Most people will just readily agree with you that they don't know when they're going to die. They could die in five minutes. They could die in 50 years. And, you know, they don't want to die, and they're, they have a general fear about dying. It's a natural thing to fear dying. Now, what about the believer? You say, when I'm taking off in that airplane, am I just like, <laughs> am I just terrified that I could die? Here's the thing. I don't really want to die right now. I pray to God, you know, a lot of times that he would keep me, um, you know, around for a while so I could, I could serve him with my life, so I could raise my children, so I could do these things. But if I do die in that moment, it's like, okay, I'm going to see Jesus. So I don't fear dying. I would rather not die now so I could do more for the kingdom of God on earth, but I, I don't fear it. I don't fear it, and neither should you if you're saved, because the devil doesn't have that power over you anymore. Because for you to die physically is to live eternally. That's it. That's all it is. But people that are not saved should have that fear of death. The Bible says that they will naturally have it. The people that are not, as Hebrews 2.15 says, they're not delivered yet. They're not delivered. So those are people without Christ. They should fear death. They should not be celebrating it. It is only Christ that can free from death, not some bananas put on a, on a statue. That, you know, not fruits and candy. It is nothing for the unsaved world, which is the vast majority of people, it is nothing for the unsaved world to be celebrating at all. Nothing. They should be terrified of death. They should be terrified of death. Everyone in this world is hanging over a cliff by a thread, and a thread that is their physical life. And at the bottom of that cliff is hell and eventually the, the lake of fire. But it's the, it, at the bottom of that cliff, and the only thing is just their next breath, and their next breath, and their next breath, the only thing keeping them from that is that thread of their physical, fragile life, which is like a vapor, like water spilled on the ground, and, and they are risking hell every moment. They are risking eternal damnation every moment. They should be terrified of this. You're out soul winning, everyone will, everyone will agree with you. If, you. if you ask people the question, you know, if you died today, a lot of times I'll, I'll preface that question with some kind of comment, like if the kid's like 16 years old or something, and I say, if you died today, I'll say to the kid, you know, look, because you don't know, you're a young guy, but you don't know if you're going to, you, you don't know how long you're going to live. Everyone will agree with you. You will never have anyone say, I know that I'm going to live to be 95 years old. Because everybody knows inherently in their conscience, just like they will freely admit that they are a sinner, they know that they have no idea when their last breath will be. But no one's really taught them the Bible. No one's really shown them the truth, shine that light on that darkness that they're in, and showed them what's below their feet showed them what's at the bottom of that cliff that they're hanging over. This is what we are doing when we go out with the Word of God. We are making that, we are making what's below their feet manifest to them. See, that's mean. What does it mean to tell people the truth? No, what's mean is to be some ministry that goes off and, and, and goes along with the world and celebrating the fact that people are hanging over hell. It's, it's literal madness to be part of this. But who wants, who wants the Bible? 
What does the devil want? He wants to make light of that. He wants to keep that covered. He doesn't want people seeing what's below their feet. He doesn't want people seeing what they're risking. Turn to Isaiah chapter 8. That's what Halloween, the Day of the Dead, the, you know, let's have a, a big party and, and have a family reunion for our dead ancestors. You're like, what in the world? It makes, it makes light, or it makes, it makes a heresy of what's true, is what it does. Look at Isaiah chapter 8 and verse 19. Isaiah chapter 8, look at verse 19. God even, uh, God, God's even confused about this. God says in Isaiah 8, 19, he says, And when they shall say to you, seek unto them that have familiar spirits. These are like witches and, you know, sorcerers, people that are, you know, conjuring spirits, and unto wizards that peep and mutter. Should not a people seek unto their God? God, God is saying, why aren't people coming to me? Why are they going to all these devil worshipers and all these people that conjure demons? which is what these familiar spirits are. And then he says, for the living to the dead, question mark. You know what that means? That little phrase there at the end that says, for the living to the dead? You know what the Bible is saying here? He's talking about the nation of Israel doing these things, and he's saying, why would the living want to go to the dead? This is like the Christian that, that is involved in Halloween, the saved person that is involved in the day of the dead. God's like, why would the living go to the dead? What? God's like, why, why would you do that? Knowing what you know as a believer, why would you do that? Look, this is what Satan's agenda is, folks. This is to make that eternal danger seem invisible. To make that fear that is natural go away. To make it seem funny, to make it seem fun, to cover it with alcohol and parties and costumes and disguises to cover it with these things to take away that fear of that physical death and what comes after. This is the agenda of these next couple of days that are celebrated in this country, to cover your conscience. See, the advantage that we have with the gospel is everybody has a conscience. This is why we can go shine that light and people will be like, oh yeah. You show them the Bible, they'll be like, that makes sense. Because everybody starts with a conscience. Everybody starts with the law written in their heart. So look, we shouldn't be celebrating death. Christians should not be celebrating death. We shouldn't fear death, but we should be fearful for the people that should fear death. But instead, we see people that should fear death and they're starting to celebrate death. They're starting to celebrate death. Now, go back to Proverbs chapter 8. There's another level about this. There's another level, and you will find people out there that actually love death. This is another level that's beyond just celebrating death. But in Proverbs 8, 36, the Bible says, Proverbs 8, chapter number 36, the Bible says, it says, He that, it says, he that sinneth against me wrongeth his own soul, and all that hate me love death. So we read that in the chapter that we read before the sermon started. So the Bible here is equating people that love death with people that hate God. So there's people out there that love death. If they love death, they hate God. If they hate God, they're going to love death. Those two things are the same. Turn to Jude. Turn to Jude. Turn to the book of Jude. Just right before the book of Revelation, you'll find the book of Jude. One chapter. Go to Jude. So you've got to be aware that there's people like this out there too. There's people like this out there as well. And they're going to love Halloween. These are going to be the people that take all this stuff over the top. Every day is Halloween for these people. Every day is celebration of death for these people. Look at Jude and look at verse number 4 of Jude. Verse number 4. The Bible says there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our Lord God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So these people, it's not that they didn't, they didn't know. These, this is a different group of people. This is, this is people that, it's not like they didn't know. It's not like you go and preach the gospel and they're like, oh, I, I had no idea that the Bible said that 
about sin, about death, about these things, that we shouldn't be doing this. I had no idea just because I didn't know. No, these people knew and they denied it. The Bible says these people knew the Word of God and they denied it. Jesus Christ is the Word of God. They knew who Jesus Christ is. They denied him, though. They said no. They rejected him. Look at verse number 11. It says, Woe unto them, for they have gone to the way of Cain and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, saying you should have nothing to do with these people. These people should not be in church. They should not be anywhere near you. Feeding themselves without fear. These people don't have fear. That, that conscience is seared in these people. And look at this. Why don't they have fear? Feeding yourselves without fear. Clouds are they without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth, without fruit, look at this, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. These are people that are walking around on the earth right now. These are people that their heart is beating and they're on the earth and the Bible is saying they are twice dead. You know what that's saying? It's like the second death has already happened in them. It's like they're done. They're done. There's people on this earth that love death, that hate the Lord. The Bible says they are twice dead. These are, these are the people that have been rejected by God. They knew God. This is Romans 1 people. This is the unnatural. These are people, they knew God, they rejected God. They knew what God said, they changed what God said. They went and they knew who God was and they worshiped something else and not God. And God said, that's it, I've rejected you. And they're twice dead. People that have experienced a second death before they've physically died. They hate God and they love death. You'll find these people. Look, loving death equals hating God. Look, Satan worship is real stuff. The occult is real. A third of the angels went with Satan. There is literally hundreds of millions of demons walking around on this earth. Witches, diviners, real stuff. You say, oh, it's just trickery. No, they're really contacting evil spirits, demons. It's real. Why in the world would anyone who calls himself a Christian want to have anything to do with this? It's hatred of God. Turn to Luke 16. These people, I mean, there's all these different places, palm readers and all this stuff. You go around Fresno, they're all over the place. And they're conjuring. You think, oh, maybe they can conjure my, my great uncle for me. They're, it's not your great uncle. Because your great uncle, if he was not saved... He is somewhere that he can't get out of. Look at Luke chapter 16. Look, it doesn't make me happy to tell people that their relatives who weren't saved are in hell, but at least we should tell people the truth so they can use that fear to get themselves and their loved ones passed from death to life. What's evil is not telling people the truth and making light and making a lie of the word of God. Look at verse uh, 26 of Luke chapter 16. Of course, we have the rich man that went to hell and Lazarus went to heaven. And the rich man, as soon as he's in hell and he realizes that he's in hell and he's there, what is he, and he can't get out. He realizes, he's like, I want someone to go tell my relatives so they don't end up here. Look at verse 26. But Abraham says to him, besides all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. It's like nobody from heaven can come to you and help you is what Abraham is telling him. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. It's like, there's nothing you could ever do to get out of there, is what he tells him. And then he says, but what about my relatives? But what about my relatives? He's like, they have the law and the prophets. You know, you know what the law is? The Bible. You know who the prophets are? You, when you carry the Bible. You, when you knock on somebody's door and you read them the Bible and you show them the gospel, you are the prophet. So who does the unsaved person have? They have the Bible and they have you. That's what the Bible says. And all these spirits, they are demons. They are demons that are tricking people. They're, they're pulling people into the occult. And look, there's wicked people out there. There's wicked people out there that love this. That love this. But the, the Bible says those people are twice dead. 
So, look, should churches have anything to do with this? Should Christians have anything to do with this? You know where you will find the most Halloween party signs in Fresno right now? In front of churches. It's crazy that they say, look, they're gonna, they, say, they say we're crazy. Look, y- you read the Bible and you find out what the Bible actually says about these things, you're just like, you're watching the world go insane around you is what you're doing. We are not trying to mimic the world here. That's what these churches are doing. We are an independent, fundamental Baptist church. You know what fundamental means? Fundamental, that word fundamental means it is centered around some um, concept or idea. You know what we are centered around? The King James Bible. That's what we are fundamental about. We're not fundamental about any Bible. We would be a changing church. Maybe we could change Bibles every year. And then we would change, you, our church would look different every year. We would do different things. We would omit things. You know, things would get weirder and weirder. We could just change the Bible. No, we are fundamentally centered around the King James Bible. That is our core principle. And that's why, from our perspective, we see the world going further and further away. And that's also why, from their perspective looking at us, we seem to just get weirder and weirder. So we have all these people in the world looking at us going, you guys don't do that. You don't send your kids. You don't let your kids. What's going on? And we're looking at them going, you're crazy. You're weird. You know, it's just like, cause, why? Because we're going like this. That's why. Every year, we're further apart. Every year, we're further apart. But guess what? This, here, here's an uh, a, a example in relativity. We're the ones that are not moving. All right? We've talked about that a lot in this year. Oh, you can't tell what's moving and everything's relative. No. We are centered. They are moving away. For sure. Because we are fundamentally centered around the King James Bible and God's word does not change. God doesn't change. That's why you see just these churches. It's just not just Halloween. It's these contemporary churches. They're just moving with the culture of the day. The rock concerts. They're just trying to, they're trying to be like the world but just a little bit better than the world. So they'll have a Halloween party, and they'll say, no scary costumes. So you have to dress your daughter up as a cute witch. Make sure she's not a scary witch, but a cute witch. Make sure you dress your daughter up as a cute devil worshiper. That's what the Bible would say. Even King Saul, the wicked king of Israel, put the witches out of the land. The Bible says, not, suffer not a witch to live. That's what God thinks about people that would worship Satan. It's crazy that churches would go along with this, you know, and, th- and think that it's okay. All right, but look, go, turn to Hebrews chapter 10. And look at verse number 25. We go to this verse a lot, but I just want to point out the last part of this verse. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25. We're moving further and further apart from the world because the world is moving further and further away from God and we are centered on God. But look at Hebrews 10.25. The Bible talks about you know, the importance of assembling as a church. It says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. And then look what it says here at the end. This is such a, it's such a smart and practical verse here. It says, So much the more as you see the day approaching. It's saying... The Bible knows here that the world is going to get worse and worse and worse. And that way, it's telling us that that church and being centered around other believers that are going to exhort you in your faith is going to be so much more important as they get for, as the world gets further away from you. So as the world gets weirder and weirder, and in five years, people start identifying as animal animals, and furniture, and whatever else, and people are like, you don't think it's normal that my son thinks he's a couch? And we're like, no, I think that's weird. I think it's unnatural. And there's 300 genders when today there's 50. And everyone's like, well, you don't think there's 300 genders? No, I think there's two. I mean, the world is going to get weird. Hey, look, it's more important that we're around like-minded believers when things get crazier and crazier and crazier. And look, we need to be reproving those things. We need to be reproving those things because look, there's a lot of people getting hurt. A lot of people getting hurt when they're talking about 
turning a little boy and giving him chemicals and, and mutilating surgeries into, you know, and, and people are talking about this today. And somebody needs to be saying this is crazy. This is child abuse. This is evil. Before it gets weirder and weirder and weirder. And, you know, it's, 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 not, it's, it's not something that we need to shine the light on these things. Because there is no other light except us. So we need to be sticking together as a church, learning the Bible, studying the Bible, shining our light everywhere we can find it. Because there's darkness all around. Turn to Matthew 22, verse 32, or just look at the front of your bulletin. Back to Halloween and the Day of the Dead. Matthew 22, 32, or the front of your bulletin, the verse of the week says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not a God of the dead, but of the living. And anybody that we can show the truth to that will then trust on the Lord Jesus Christ can move from that darkness to light. They can move from that death to life. And that is what we are to do. God frees people from death. But death is very serious to the unsaved. It's not something to joke about and make light of. Satan wants the lost to remain dead because he's dead. Because he ends up in the lake of fire. I mean, we should not be celebrating death. Churches, look, churches, I, just these churches that are, have all these signs out for trunk or treat and all this kind of stuff. First of all, I, most of them don't have the right gospel anyway. But it is just pitiful. If there is a church out there preaching the true gospel and they are involved in any way in this celebration of Halloween, or the Day of the Dead, it, is, it, it sickens me. Because they should have nothing to do with it. Do with it. It, should, it needs to be reproved, not joined, not fellowshipped with. All right? So look, we need to be getting the news of this to the dead so they can be brought to life. Right? It's a very serious thing. So, you know, you know what we're going to celebrate? We're going to celebrate the seasons changing tonight. Because God gave us the seasons. So, as we celebrate... Going into fall tonight, praise God for the seasons. Praise God for this beautiful creation that he gave us. Praise God for the harvest, for the blessings that he gives us, for the fruits and the vegetables and everything that is good that comes from God. That's what we will celebrate as Christians. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.